Welcome to our countdown of the top 100 games of all time. I should specify my countdown because there's been some heavy disagreement here, specifically in regards to a certain IP space game in last week's or two weeks ago's list. I'm convinced that you just doubled down on this to, to no, make us... I, make... No, I didn't. I swear. I rated it Re- at that rating yeah, re- months and months ago. Yeah. And Rebellion it just happened... A, a better game than most of the games we're going to talk about in the next hour and a half. Starting uh, as a downer. As always, I am Mark. Here with me today is Matt. I'm not a downer. I'm the most positive person I know. Okay. And we have Orion. <laughs> Hello. We are counting down the top 100 games of all time. Today's installment is numbers 60 through 41. Starting to get good. They're all good, though, but they're starting to get better. More good. (laughs) More More good, good, as you heard in last week's or last time's podcast. Yes, more good. These games are all more good than last time's games. It's really annoying not to be able to say last week. I I should just say last week and confuse people. It's fine. Maybe you should have just done this every week for five weeks instead of interspersing it every other week. I very briefly considered doing it like... One week, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, oh, Thursday, Friday. That'd be but a that's a, that'd be a lot. <laughs> that'd be a lot of work for a very brief amount of time content. Anyways, we're gonna talk about some great games today. All of them better than Star Wars Rebellion, demonstrably so. Starting, oh, actually, before I get to the first game, let me know. I did calculate some statistics about these games. Do you guys want to hear the stats from the previous lists? Well, sure. I mean. We know that they're wrong, but sure. We love stats. Unlike Twitter, which says stats are for nerds and for losers, but stats are awesome. Is that a weird sports Twitter thing? what Twitter do you follow? No, well, there's this thing on Twitter right now because analytics have been, like, more in the public discussion or whatever. Oh, like in the NBA? Especially in regards to sports, uh, mostly football, I think. Okay. But there's, there's a strong contingent of people that are on the hashtag film over numbers bandwagon or train oh or whatever. Gosh. And it's just, the whole thing is just stupid. But there's this, like, it's kind of a joke, but it's the, also what people test. actually think of, like, All right. an- analytics are for losers. All, because, well, all games whatever. in this this episode will be vetted by the eye test. <laughs> we will show you as many as we can. Should I put up like get, get the support hashtag analytics sign behind me or something? <laughs> yes. So let's get okay. Get your statistics out of the way so we can talk about. All our, right. Well, you know. the previous two lists in terms of their BGG presence were actually fairly similar. So the previous forty games about an average weight of two point six, two point six five around there, which is little lighter on the lighter side three is approximately average or three would be a medium rating on the dot okay average rating around 7.6 which is good we've gone through 10 games on the top 100 already and three games from the top 20 on bgg's list really yes oh okay uh those games were caverna uh what else so only a quarter of your list would be on the top or 10 of your 40 are on the BGG top 100? Yeah, I think the rate increases as we go up, but that's from the last two lists. I would think Caverna, so, but... Terraform, Terraforming Mars, and Star Wars Rebellion would be the ones on the BGG top 20 that made my 60 and or 61 in, through 100. This list, interestingly, because I generally like heavier games, but this particular segment of 60 through 41 has the lowest weight average of 2.46. In this list, there will be six games that appear on the BGG Top 100 and zero from the Top 20. But this is the lightest on average grouping of games, which I found interesting because in the next two installments, the, the average weight skyrockets. The next two are well above three on average. So, I don't know, a quirk of my list. But without further ado, let's talk about number 60. Starting off, I think, with a controversial pick. Yeah, it'll be a controversial pick. El Grande. Or at least controversial at this table. Which is a classic area control or area majority, really, game. With a cool bidding mechanism, 
cool kind of resolution of special powers and lots of beige. What more could you want from a game? Yeah, it also the, has a tower. Yeah, the artwork is pretty lame. The tower is pretty awesome. The tower's awesome and almost extravagant. Like, if that game could be extravagant, given its kind of monochromatic brownness... It's a pretty austere game. Yeah. Uh, the tower... It's like when you talk to someone and they're like, oh, I guess I'll splurge on one cookie. You know, <laughs> I'll break my diet for one little cookie. And you're like, yeah, okay. That's not really splurging on anything. That's kind of what the tower is. It's like, oh, look, we made something visually Yeah, it's mostly impressive. just wooden cubes. But I love wooden cubes. And this is one of the best cube-based games. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know, Mark. Um, this seems reasonable. Uh, like a oh, you like the a game. reasonable placement. Oh, okay. I don't hate the game. Well, I, I I should be clear. There's like a very. I've only played this game once, and there, there's some things that I really don't like about it. Um, there's some things that I think that probably more recent games have improved greatly on. But um, at least as a his historical in the spirit of Catan, I can see this being kind of a great great game in board gaming history at least sure well it's undoubtedly that i mean this puerto rico and Catan are probably the most significant ones from the 90s if i re- if actually puerto rico may not be the 90s but anyway i think it is a deliciously tight thinky really elegant system of area majority despite its looks and not in spite of its cubes because cubes are great cubes are great and the Castillo is great, and I can see why it's a classic, but this game is just fine. It's not, though, and that's why it's number 60. I have such bad arguments today. I gotta step up my disagreement game. Okay, my point is, I can see why it's regarded as a classic, because it has the bidding mechanism, I think, is quite interesting compared to some other games, or at least as a as a foundation for other games, and that I think that's a great me- mechanic. And the different powers flipping over is interesting, but I didn't have fun playing the game. And some of that, I think, will improve with future plays, as you know the cards, but that's just kind of a huge black mark in that I didn't have fun playing the game, and that's kind of the whole point of board gaming. Oh, sure. I, I can't deny yeah. your um... feelings. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what to say. For a game of this weight, there's an awful lot of direct screwing over. Well, I think that's kind of the beauty of it, because it, it is a Euro game, but it's an incredibly interactive and mean one. I love interactive, mean Euro games. So maybe it's just that it's it's a game that kind of fits my it's tendencies. It's interactive and mean, but also feels like you have less direct control over what's going to happen, I think. Than, than some very mean games like, say, Agricola. I mostly disagree. I think I think it's about kind of damage mitigation just like Agricola is in some senses. It doesn't have engine building like Agricola does. It's entirely this kind of round-by-round round tactical game where you're trying to kind of squeeze out as much in the, in the battles almost, the passive-aggressive battling over territory as you can, given whatever cards come up to be to be used that that round who won the game we played at pax it was really close between a couple it it was really close i think i got third maybe maybe bubba no i thought bubba i I thought bubba could no you won you won won. yeah yeah and bubba like could have tied you if someone else had done the opposite thing like yes it It was was really tight making situation which is another thing i don't like that's literally any game with interaction, Fine. Like, di- like direct interaction <laughs> can have that. So, yeah, it's a good game. I, I I think it's interesting because for me, I would leave this game behind for some more modern games, whereas you would take this and leave Catan behind. Whereas I still like. Oh, absolutely! I think El Grande is. I think a lot of modern games could learn from the elegance of El Grande and its mechanisms because it's a very simple set of rules and gets a lot of game out of it. Moving down now to number 59, we have the first of, spoiler warning, the first of a few coin games on this list. So this would be my 
least favorite coin game, but it's still a great game. And of that the is the ones you've played. And of the like ones I've played. played so. Yeah, yeah. Of the of the few I've played, and that is Colonial Twilight. This is a game that really deserves another play. I uh, I think we've I've only played it once. Have you played it more than that? No, I think it was just the once, but it was a it was really fun. Yeah, it deserves another play. I it's hard for me to evaluate because Neither of us really knew what we were doing, and as is the case with a lot of these games, uh, especially these kind of GMT coin games, it's sometimes more just about reenacting the history or kind of getting a sense of that period or that uh, conflict, and less about, you know, like a precise Euro engine efficiency sort of, uh, you know, action choose uh, selection. And in that sense, it's, it's still fun the first time, and... I would love to see kind of what happens as you play it the second, third, fourth time. Oh, absolutely. But I mean, I couldn't leave games that I've only played once off the list because, you know, some of them you play once and you're like, well, that's a great game, you know, and... and, Oh, sure. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons it's ranked lower. The other reason it would fall last, I guess, on my list of the coin games, which, you know, as you can probably figure out, is a series of games I absolutely love is that it's the only two-player coin game. And a lot of the strength of the other games that we'll be talking about later, I believe in this list and maybe you know in future lists, is that in those, they're, they're specifically four-player and asymmetrical and gain so much from the interaction between these very interrelated parties in that historical conflict, whereas this one's much more head-to-head. And they They do a great job of adapting the card play system of the coin games to a two-player game mechanically, but it still loses a bit from not having other parties at work. That said, I thought it it was really well done in terms of how they still introduced kind of varying dynamics as the game progressed, where if I remember correctly, like one side of the map is almost like off limits to this one faction, but it kind of deteriorates, that situation deteriorates over time. Well, there's the two neighboring countries that you can't go into. And then there's kind of the deep desert where the uh, government party really just, they can't afford to get there. It's just too far. And that's where the rebels really build their base of support. Right. That's right. I remember there's something interesting geographic there. It's been a little while, but, that, those kind of dynamics are what these card-based games do so well because they can utilize the events that happened in history. And like I said, I've only played it once, and I don't have a lot of specific to say about it other than that coin games are great. This was another great one, and we need to play it again. Yeah. And sure. I think the, the two-player versus four-player is, uh, is a fair point, but I will come back and say that this is an excellent two-player version of the coin system. Oh, yeah. And probably the best from a design standpoint facet of this was how they did like the action grid for the two oh yeah system. the way they adapted that was just perfect like yeah. they what, did what is such the a good grid? well you know how in like fire and lake the first person chooses like an event and that lets the other person do a special action okay. or if you choose a regular action then the other person can only do a, a limited command okay and this has a similar thing but it's in like this kind of circle pattern so the first person takes a spot and then the second person can take a spot adjacent to that. So it kind of has the same the same idea of a, a limiting what your what the other person can do. But then I think there's also a color coding so that two of the spots mean that you will go first next time and then the other two mean you'll go second next time, right? Yeah, they basically created the same dynamic with two players, and honestly, when I heard about the game, I did not know how they were going to do it, and they just made this graphical representation of how to do it, and it works flawlessly. Very cool. Yeah, so well done there. That I don't is... know anything about the French Algerian War. Neither do I, but it's still some, it's something to learn about. All I know is that there's a very famous movie about it that I haven't seen. This is supposed to be one of the best war movies ever made. Called? I think it's just called Algiers, or The Battle for Algiers. It's been in the '60s, I believe. It's it's on my list of my very long list of movies to see, but I've I've heard it's it's excellent. Next on my list is I believe the only solo game on my list, and that is Freedom and Freeze's Friday. I think you're the only person who's played this. No, I've played it a number of times. 
I think even Amber's played it. I think I taught her the game. Oh, okay. Have you not played Friday? I've never played. Was, Friday. was that you a would whoosh, love was this that a game? Whoosh moment. A little. <laughs> bit. Were you going for something there? It was a little bit. Okay. Oh, sorry. It's a solo deck builder push your luck game and does all of those things very very well. the The idea is that you are a person stranded on a desert island and that you have to fight obstacles and enemies in bad situations to survive. But those things are very difficult to get by, and as you defeat them, you gain new and better powers with which to defeat better or more difficult obstacles over time, and you try to snowball from there. However, you also start out with a hand of cards that frankly sucks and is no good. And they're mostly negative or zero. Yeah, and they do like nothing, and you're trying to trash those cards as you go through the deck, which you do by failing obstacles in your way. Yeah, so you want to strategically fail certain challenges to get rid of your bad cards and then choose your spots to go for adding cards into your deck and then try to snowball that into a victory. But each time you go through the uh, the threat deck, you have to increase the difficulty and then you have to deal with the next level of threat on that card. And every time... Uh, there's so many like cool almost like boomerang things because the first time through the deck, you're mostly trying to strategically fail the obstacles. But then every time you do that, you lose your part of your life counters. And so you're trying to get down just on the brink of death to get bad cards out of your hand and try to accumulate a couple of good ones. And then in kind of the second phase of the game, you're trying to slingshot back and then win a whole bunch of things to, to build up again, a good deck and from the, the one you total. just trashed, and your life total as you play cards that give you lives. And then each card you gain from defeating obstacles not only has a certain power rating, but also has an effect. So you're tactically trying to play those effects in the best order to try to defeat the obstacle in front of you. But then you can't make your deck, your play deck too small, because every time you go through your play deck... You get an aging card, which, which is, is just really a really nasty card in your deck. So you have to kind of like you whittle down your deck and then rapidly grow it yep. and build it up to something great. And then you'll have a chance to get through the final deck and then the two bosses at the end. Yep. Really, really clever, engaging solo game system. I'm not a huge solo game player, but I think this one does just such a great job of making a compelling game in about 20 minutes or so. Yeah, something like uh, that. With, with a lot of thought. Next is a game that we do not have, but if I did, it would be set down on the table in front of me with a cavernous thud because it's massive and huge and heavy and full of miniatures, and that is Mechs versus Minions, a zany programming cooperative game with... We talked on the last one about Millennium Blades being kind of excessive with components, Nothing, I think, can ever beat mechs versus minions in terms of excess. There are, what, like 250 miniatures in there? Yeah, and they all, they could just be cubes. I mean, they, like, they're custom, like, 3D printed plastic miniatures. Well, molded. Or 3D, mold, mold, okay, yeah, yeah mold, molded. They're all, in the game, they're all functionally the same. They're just these little minion enemies that come marching at you. And then there's a couple bosses that need to be different, but... They could all be tokens. They could all be tokens. <laughs> or but, cubes or something, or, yeah. you know, something less expensive to produce. And they're just, they're all these great minis, and I think there's like five different versions of them <laughs> or something. Yeah, and so you open the box, and it's just tray after tray of them. Yeah. And the game retails for 80 bucks. Yeah. Like, it's astounding how much value they got out of this. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, it's a, it's a League of Legends-themed game. <laughs> cooperative where you go through these missions and you're trying to defeat the minions coming at you or accomplish some goal while the minions are streaming at you so you get the sense of like just hordes of enemies coming at you and you're you're doing a programming thing where you program out your actions and then you play them out and oftentimes very unexpected things happen based on the movement of the minions or other players or damage cards that you're dealt throughout the game, which can be very significant when you take damage. Yeah, they tend to add a random program into your your board at a random location, which our favorite is, of course, the rocket whoopsie. 
where you charge three spaces for it and do a 180. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, we should talk about what the actual gameplay is like. You are programming these registers with various cards that that, that are what shared. Basically, you you each you draft put, them. You There's draft a shared them. draft pool, but it's cooperative. Yeah, so it's a cooperative draft. And, and then you're you're programming your registers, and then in order you do all the things on your turn. Yeah, I think it's like six and, spaces or something. And and, and they're like four categories, like movement, maybe a couple kinds of attacks. Turn, whatnot. attack, and yeah, something like that. But the, the important part... Well, I don't know what you're getting at. Oh. Is it that they stack? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but they stack. So over the course of the game, you might go from a very limited and situational action that may or may not help you to, to something that has a little more option and is extremely powerful. Right. Or, that... or if it's like an area of effect attack, it'll be a bigger cone and more damage or yeah. something. Yeah. So as the game progresses, you are upgrading the, these registers to the coolest sequence of events that are executed each turn. But you're ultimately limited because you have the sequence of events. Y you have to kind of balance like something that is optimal for now, but also reusable yeah so it, it makes a really fun challenge and i'm glad this yeah. game made the list because we had a blast playing it, it's it. a blast one it, it does the the horde of minion thing probably better than any other game i've ever played in part just because of the the, the excessive minis and two i'm pretty sure that robo rally isn't on your top 100 but, I've only played it once way back in college, and but, I literally can't remember it. But yeah, I mean, this is a game that I played way back in college. Kind of blew my mind at the time. And this feels like a better kind of matured version of Robo Rally. Yeah. Ro Robo Rally did the kind of programming the registers thing. Yeah, yeah. And you say matured, but frankly, the adjective I think of when I think of mechs versus minions is cartoony. Like, it's cartoonish, like, crazy wild things are going to happen. You're just flying across this board and, like, running into people and mowing down minions and doing weird gadget attacks. And it feels like a cartoon. Like, it's way less serious than I think, League, in my experience, at least, playing League of Legends. Although some of the characters there are kind of Oh, yeah, for cartoony. sure. And, I mean, even as Orion mentioned, like, when things go wrong, all of a sudden you have a rocket whoopsie in your register. Although, frankly, is, I utilize that Rocky yeah, Orpsy to great effect. It's incredibly silly. It could be really bad, but you can also use it to, to great effect. Yeah, just a, a hilarious game. Speaking of cartooning, number 56 is certainly cartoony in its artwork. A great little drafting game, I think. One of the best family games out there, and it is Sushi Go Party from Game Right, local company. I haven't played the original, although the original is... Built within the party version, the party one just it, it adds variability to the game or variation in the setup and all that. So it's just a strictly better version of the game. And I love drafting games. We talked about a few already, though there will certainly be more later on the list. This is about as simple as a drafting game can be in terms of just like very basic set collection or certain things are worth like one or two points and incorporates all that you want in a drafting game with very little rules overhead yeah great art delicious pictures yeah what's not to love it makes you want to eat anthropomorphized sushi with oh, little yeah. eyeballs yeah i mean it, it makes me hungry at least oh yeah, yeah. it's delicious food well Sushi's i mean it's great this is one of those games that if you're trying to sell to non-gamers yeah you had like, someone kind of skeptical this it, board gaming thing you're into it's so cute it's easy to play. And it's strategic. Like a yeah. lot of games that are trying to cater towards yeah. people who aren't into games just end up taking away a lot of the strategy. And this uh, it isn't as deep as other drafting games, no. but it's strategic and you're going to make a lot of good, interesting decisions. Absolutely. Uh, it's a solid game. In fact, I would say some kind of like higher level strategies are easier to get into in Sushi Go than other drafting games, mm. simply because the base mechanics are simpler. Each kind of sushi scores in a, a very different way, but none of them are very complicated. But it's, it's easier to get a grasp on the basic scoring than in, say, Seven Wonders, 
in a more competitive game of Sushi Go, uh, it's easier to kind of get to those second le- level strategies, I think. That's a very good point I didn't think of. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, even though you can still get get to those second level strategies in a more complex game, a complex drafting game. But they're, they're more evident here. It, it's it, easier just, to calculate them. Yeah. And there's, so it's just it ends up being a great game that is also something that you can play with your parents or your girlfriend or or whatever. <laughs> Next on the list is a variation on a game that, I'm doing a lot of spoilers today, spoiler warning will be higher on the list, but this as a variation or almost like, it could be like almost a homebrew variant, I think, on that style of game is still very fun, and this game is Secret Hitler. I just played Secret Hitler, not last weekend, but before. Oh, how was it? It was fun, yeah. We, uh... We kind of had a Hitler-themed weekend, if you will, because we played this <laughs> Friday night, and then we played Axis and Allies all day Saturday. But no, this was uh, it was fun. Yeah. We should make this clear that in your games, you were almost always trying to defeat Hitler, with a couple exceptions. Well, as it turns out, in both Secret Hitler games, I happened to be a fascist, <laughs> and then I did, in fact, play as Germany in Axis and Allies. So I don't know what that says. So I guess oh, you my. had a hitler theme party. Everyone else had a defeat Hitler defeat pattern. fascism party. I suppose so. <laughs> Let's no, not take that one it's out a, of context. Yeah, right. Please don't. <laughs> don't save that for later when I'm trying to run for office or something. Jeez. But no, it, this is a fun game. It's the your social deduction game. It's a twist on the resistance, what may be a little more well-known um, uh, precursor. And I think the story was that the designers had just played out resistance and they made a new game that they wanted to play kind of in that same vein but yeah it's it's fun there's enough there to keep you entertained and it can support up to whatever 12 people so 10 to 12 maybe yeah yeah it it basically takes the resistance and then adds more information so i think it might be if you have someone who can kind of moderate and teach the game very well it might be an easier entry point into the kind of hard social deduction game in terms of being able to get information to make intelligent plays on, the resistance is a lot more subtle, but Secret Hitler has a harder rules overhead, so it's a weird problem to have. Regardless, I think it is an enjoyable social deduction game that adds a few little twists and makes, you know, a little twist on kind of an old classic, and I love the style of game, and I think it's a good example of one. Yeah, I'd say that this is one of the games that really succeeded post-Resistance, where, where Resistance just redefined the social deduction genre. Mm-hmm. This is a game that succeeded in doing something unique with it and, and, and being a great game. I've enjoyed all the games I've played, but I also haven't played with the same group of people enough times to see a meta develop and evolve. I think there's certainly potential for a meta. I, I, I really yeah. do think so. Um, and, but in the few games that I have played, I've had those incredibly satisfying moments where someone has figured out who the bad guys are and is trying to convince someone else that that's the case. And then there's a debate. And well, in the game I'm remembering, they didn't believe me. And oh, that's right. Yes, I actually, remember that. I believe that you were Hitler. In I that was game, Hitler Mark. in that game, and yeah. I did an amazing job being Hitler. I was so right. <laughs> I was so incredibly right. And Don't take that one out of context either. <laughs> Please. And this person that we were playing with did not believe me. And anyway, I, 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 I had. You sound sur- a little bitter, Matt. It w- I am bitter, but I'm also. I also think of of that experience so fondly. So this is a game that I'd love to play more. I'd love to see a meta develop, but um, it's it's a success, which is hard to do in the wake of how great the resistance is. I had the great experience of being the spy or you know fascist in this game and convincing a liberal that I was uh, that I was on the up and up and so then we were like buddy buddy and like figuring everything out and once you get like once you get that trust oh it's so good just like <laughs> you just like twist the game and you're like oh yes yes give me the win and then you you defeat them at the end and it's... you mock them relentlessly oh it's it's so great <laughs> so good 
Oh man, moving on. Lovely, lovely game design, like a uh, gra- graphic design, by the way. Yeah, I th- I think it's it's pretty I, I think it's pretty good. It's fine for what it is. It's I, yeah. I, I don't think it's I, ama- I, I really like, enjoy the reptile fascists. That just eh, tickles it's, it's my all right. fancy. It tickles your fancy. <laughs> all right. All right, let's move on to the next one. Number 54 of my top 100 games of all time is a team cooperative or team versus team game, Captain Sonar. Another game I played uh, a week and a half ago. I mean, that's the theme of this list. Games Orion played a week and a half ago. Is Axis not with on any this of list? us. No, it's not on. Okay. <laughs> it was very, very far down <laughs> that's my right. list. I, I forgot you hate fun. No, I, I'm, I'm kidding. Axis Nally is, is, is a fine game, but it's not. It's extremely bloated. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, this is a fun game. You're, you've got two teams of four as uh, competing submarine crews, and you're playing in real time trying to navigate an underwater grid and keep your sub together and be in the right position to, you know, fire a torpedo and destroy the other sub. And it creates so much tension and it really brings out personalities and you just see, like, how people act under stress is so much fun to watch, especially when you're with a new group or a different, like, a different subset of people. It's it's so interesting. Subset. <laughs> it is a, is a pun creation machine, but also it's a party game that is actually difficult. Like it kind of bridges the gap between like a strategic real time game and then just a game you can pull out at a party because the more experienced people can take the more difficult two roles, the captain and the sonar operator or the sonar operator, radio operator, sonar or yeah. Yeah. Something like that. And then the people who aren't as experienced or don't want to take on those more challenging roles can take on the engineer or the first mate, which are, I think, substantially easier roles to take in the submarine. And everyone can have a fun, tense, exciting, real-time game and just feel like they're part of a team, even if they're not yeah. necessarily taking on the hardest challenges. Yeah, no, because, I mean, all all the roles are crucial to the functioning of the sub even though you know, some the, are less demanding than others. the captain is the one really making the decisions and the sonar ar- operator is the you know really has to be constantly listening to what the other team is doing the other two rules are a little less demanding but are essential to ultimately kind of executing the maneuvers that you need to to win right and just the theme of battling submarines is Oh yeah, it's cool. Like yeah. it, it'd oh. be hard to go wrong with a team battling submarine game. So at least in this group, we've only played the first mission. I'm curious, Orion, when you played recently, did you play any of the other missions? Well, when I, I was introducing, almost half the table had not played. Yeah, and so we started with the basic mission. And then I had promised them that after this, we will add the extra rules. And so we jumped from map A, and then we jumped to map E, which is the most difficult one, where there are these remote mines scattered throughout the map, and you can charge up your uh, scenario meter to detonate any one of them at, Whoa. at, at point. So, yeah, that was, that, was, that was good. It, it added, like, another thing to do. I don't know if it was that. There was a lot of missed mines in the in the game we played yeah. on that one. But, uh, yeah, it was it was sweet. It added another thing to think about. Yeah, so, I mean, we, together, the three of us, have only played the base scenario. And I think I could play that 20 times. And it would continue oh, to... still be engaging. You know, yeah. it would still be engaging, especially because it's just head-to-head. I, w- um, I want to play the ice head, one head where team. you can only surface right. like in the certain spots. That yeah. one looks nuts. But yeah. On top of just how fascinating this team versus team game is, are these scenarios that 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 are going to just give the game more and more life. And I think they just released the second expansion pack of scenarios. Oh, I didn't even realize there were expansions. That's yes, fantastic. there are. The biggest downside, honestly, to the game is that it really works best at exactly eight or exactly six players. Which is kind of a downer. You can you can certainly work around that, but to get the full experience, that's what you want. But that is Captain Sonar, a great team versus team game in real time. It's like being a space team, except not in space. Exactly. But our next game is in space. Number 53, Eclipse. Oh, yeah. This is one of those boxes where you just open it and it's just 
full of stuff. Yeah, there's lots of plastic in here. Plastic and cardboard. I'm curious, thing. how far did this fall? Oh, how far did it fall? It was on the From top 50. Year. It yep. fell only 11 spaces, okay. which is actually one of the shortest falls, given how many new games are on the list. Yeah, yeah. Eclipse has big, huge swings from being like one of the most enjoyable games I've played to being kind of a downer, that my rating kind of splits the difference. Yeah, that seems right. It's a 4X game with, honestly, a brilliant income resource management system where you're trying to manipulate the resources and not and you have to like work with your income levels and not spend too many resources based it's it's a 4x yeah and and it's in a 4x game where you're exploring uh settling on planets and trying to defeat other players and it's got this awesome spaceship customization system where you customize what your different ships actually do in terms of their mobility and their strength and what kind of weapons they have on them. And all of that is so cool. And then it has this really kind of anticlimactic end game, but I can pretty easily ignore that because the experience of playing Eclipse is so fun Especially yeah. just customizing your spaceships and being threatening and stuff. No, you're right. The The experience of playing Eclipse is great. It is. It, it gives you the feeling of what you want in a 4X. I, I, I mean, I think the tension... So this is one of those games that I had to adjust my expectations because it's it's not quite what it seems. Um, it's a lot more... It truly is, a, is like a Euro... It's a cube Optimus. pusher 4X game. It's awesome. more it's more European than American. Yeah, so maybe the the least satisfying thing about this game is the end game that you talked about where it's too easy to calculate the the exact kind of numbers of it exactly what your risk is where in a in a grand 4X what you really want is that kind of experience of applying your power I mean, you do do that in Eclipse. It just doesn't seem as exciting as in other games of yeah. its type, I think. Yeah. You maybe have one or two satisfying combats in a game of Eclipse. Yeah. It's almost like this game, you have like an early climax. Like you have a couple turns building up and then you have a climax where you maybe fight there. And then you have another swing of like upgrading research. And then you have another climax around turn eight. And then turn nine is just like counting points. Yeah, which... Which Again, is it's fine. a bit it's of just, a downer. It's just the way it is, and yeah. I think it's one so, of the reasons yeah. we play it less. Yeah, but well, I think there's still a lot to be said for this game, and it's for a game with this theme. I think the feeling that we crave is what Twilight Imperium gives us, right? Which um, is why we end up playing that a lot more than this, right? Right, because they're they're effectively competing over table time, like because yeah. they're they're ostensibly the same genre, same similar feelings but i mean on it they, they are very different games but i mean completely different games yeah but they they both take a very long time and have the same it, setting basically it, it's a super interesting thing that i think the theme is one that wants that grand space opera where you actually use your your huge fleets and well twilight imperium i think meshes theme and mechanics better than this <laughs> I would agree, but I still think there are some really, really, really clever mechanisms yeah, in Eclipse. Yeah. Um, that you know, I and it's hurt by that comparison, down. but you know, overall it's still a Absolutely. brilliant game. Absolutely. Yeah. That's why it's on the list. Let's move on to number fifty two, a substantially smaller box, and that is Harvest from Tasty Minstrel Games. Oh, how lovely. Which Fun story, and hopefully if you're listening and are from Tasty Mentral, you get a laugh out of this. They sent me an email. They send one periodically every few months, and like, here are the new games we're releasing, uh, and they have a little form. They send it to, re to reviewers. They have a little form you fill out if you want to receive a review copy of one of them. And so they had a list of like four games, and I looked them up, and I think I selected two of them. I'm like, hey, I'm interested in these if you want to send them out. And Harvest was not one of the ones I selected. And then they sent me Harvest instead of one of the other games I requested. But fortunately, Harvest is great. <laughs> so it was a 
great happenstance that I ended up getting this game. It is a little farming worker placement game that finishes in about 45 minutes to an hour, has a small little box, but a bunch of really clever systems inside. And poop. And poop emoji shaped tokens to s- signify manure. Did we decide that? Fertilizer. I don't even know what it's actually called. We I believe it's poop. called fertilizer in the okay. game, but really, come on. Poop. It's poop. I think one of the cleverest things about the game is the initiative system where you get this random set of initiative cards, which will determine the turn order for the next round. And they have a bunch of different resources on them. And you take one of the cards, you get the resources, or sometimes you get to play an action. They get some benefits on them. And then you put into the pile your initiative card you had the round before. And it's kind of a variation of what we see in games like Viticulture, where if you go later, you get a better bonus. But I think it's done really well with a lot more variability in this one with all the different cards that you can choose from. It also has really dramatic special player abilities, So all these different characters you can choose from that fundamentally change your strategy. And you really have to focus your strategy in the game around whatever player character you're in control of, which can introduce you to kind of different ways to play the game. Just a delightful little worker placement experience that I love. It's what, five rounds? Yeah, five rounds in total. Five rounds, you get two actions plus like an initiative card, so you kind of get three actions each round. Yeah, really short, but you end up doing a lot more than you think you will. Yeah, you do. And you, you have a you have enough time to get through kind of the cycle of getting seeds, planting, maturing them, watering them, and then harvesting them. You You can get through that about twice. And so you have enough time to do stuff. But it doesn't really drag on too much. And so you get a nice early game, and then you get a nice like final loop, and, and, you, and you're done. Yeah, it like, cuts out the what can happen in the middle of some games where you're just kind of grinding. It just kind of has a really nice opening game, and then you like immediately shift to the late game to try to squeeze out victory points. And I imagine that was a tricky thing to do in the design, but it does it really well. It hits a really unique spot of, of these engine builders that... Don't last long, <laughs> I guess. Really, really, the thing to me that, that sets it really apart is how unique each player board plays. And it's just so, it, it's almost whimsical in how these characters have a unique way of farming. And it, it vastly changed how you end up playing because you, your bonus is a completely different area than everyone else at the table. Yeah, and at least in the kind of the top almost the top half, this might be one of the less known games. Top half of my list, I mean. Uh, The less known games on there. So you haven't heard of Harvest, I highly recommend you check it out because I think it's fairly inexpensive. It's at least, it's a small box game. But you're going to get a lot of strategic meat there. And again, kind of what you would expect from a worker placement farming game just condensed down to about 45 minutes. Which is really cool. it's a game that everyone should have because if you love heavy worker placement games, this is the game that you can play when you don't have enough time. If you're not into that yet, this is the game that you can play that's easy to get into. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, really good for a lot of different people. And that is Harvest. Next game on my list is a delightful game about taking a nice pleasant walk, and that is Tokaido. Oh, this game number 51 on my list mark's favorite design style my favorite art style yeah that white background art man things on a white background i don't know why it just it does it for me that's the i love it it looks so good it's honestly it continually surprises me how much i enjoy this game because it's not a game i should enjoy it's not that strategic there aren't that many interesting decisions but Darn it, it's just pleasant. Like, I just like it. I like how every, you know, you get these these characters and they do something you know, a bit better. You know what I think of this game? I, I, I think I do know what you think of this game. I think it's going to be a four-letter word that starts with F. It is. It is a... <laughs> we'll leave that up to the listener. To this... <laughs> now you have to think of a different word that's not fine, huh? <laughs> Well, I can do that, but this is a family-friendly podcast. Uh, This game is a fine game. 
It is more than a fine game. It is a very fun game. I think it's the it's the kind of game where you're presented with just like a choice between two things, usually maybe three things, maybe four if you're feeling risky, and you just got to find the best one and go for it. It can be surprisingly cutthroat, especially at two players, where it turns into an incredibly passive-aggressive game yeah. because you have this little neutral worker that you just use to block all the spots that your opponent wants to go to. But it's got a little set collection. It's got a little kind of uh, one-upmanship thing on the temple track. You're traveling along this road. Whoever's furthest back gets to take their move. All the art looks nice. It's got uh, cool you know little what? money with holes in it. It's, uh, it's di- just delightful. All the, the different ways to score are lovely. I'll give it that. Um, I think where I think this game's fine, where you you think it, it's great, it is more in that kind of blocking people. It, it really is a game about doing the best action for you, but also just screwing other people over. But in a nice, friendly way. In, as you stroll down the road. Yeah. Have you played with the expansion yet? Oh, the I cross? don't know that I have. I don't you might I have. like the expansion. It what adds, does it add? It adds a decision at every po- every stopping point. Oh, so there's cool. another like sub-decision you make. Very cool. Different card sets. A little bit of... There's like a push-your-luck gambling die, which is fun. Okay. Uh, like on the farm. Not, wor- not worth it, but... It's like slightly not worth it. Yeah, we got to play with the with the Crossroads expansion one time. I think it you is might a beautiful enjoy game. It. Yeah, it is a beautiful game. That's number fifty one, Tokaido. I mentioned last podcast that Five Tribes number sixty one on my list was not my favorite Days of Wonder game. I think this one. I don't think there are any Days of Wonder games above this one. But I maybe I'll be, I'll correct myself in the future. Anyway, it's a Days of Wonder game, part of a system I already talked about, and that is Memoir Forty Four. I, I think this game has the distinction of being the most expensive game that I bought after you bought. For a good reason. For a good reason. I loved it and I wanted to own it so that I didn't have to walk across town to play it. <laughs> it's a two-player World War II game with some fun little minis. It's the command and color system I talked about a couple weeks ago on the last installment And that just means that you have a hand of cards and you kind of have to manage that hand of cards really well to make sure you don't get locked out on one part of the battlefield. It covers a bunch of different scenarios in World War II. There are roughly 1.7 billion expansions to it if you really love the game, including a campaign book, which I might might try to get at one point because that sounds like a cool thing to do, have a really like continuing campaign. And a... Dirt simple system that anyone can learn that creates a lot of exciting moments. Even though it's like a fully dice-based combat resolution, it plays really well and ends up being shockingly strategic every time I play it. Yeah. And then the cherry on top is that if you have a friend like Matt who buys his own copy of the game, you can combine them together to create an Overlord game, which just blows my mind with how much it changes the dynamics of memoir it's such a cool experience and i until about 30 seconds ago i had forgotten how much fun we had playing the overlord scenario we did that one time and we definitely have to do that again soon it kind of adds like another complete level on top of the decisions yeah because it makes someone overseeing the entire battle so what you do is you combine the two boards together to make this huge wide battlefield and then someone is like the general and they're handing cards to the people who are managing the smaller aspect of the play area can't you also only talk to one player each turn yeah that's the cool part it creates this like logistical problem where you have to make sure that the cards you're handing out like becomes kind of obvious of what you want them to do with that card because you can only talk to one of the people each round you hand out cards and again it sounds like incredibly simplistic when you explain what it is, but it ends up being really, really fun and, again, surprisingly strategic. Yeah, the actual combat is really simple. It's dice-based. There are only a handful of, of units, tanks, and troops, and artillery. But the the terrain is super cool. What really sets it apart for me is you're always playing a historical battle. And, you know, the missions, setup guides have flavor text. You're always playing some real battle. It also has 
one of the coolest like one-off scenario rules I've ever seen where there's this one mission that was a parachuting like airdrop mission and to simulate that you hold you physically hold the troop <laughs> the group of units in your hand at least a foot above the ba- the table and then you drop them and wherever they land that's where your units land in the battle <laughs> and if they if they like bounce off the map they just like don't show up yeah it's it's certainly up there for one of the greatest board game rules ever made. I think it's so funny. <laughs> like, it's just a stupidly clever... It's something like you would think of and be like, huh, that was dumb. I won't do that. But they put it in there, and it works really well. Yeah, what a great randomness generator. Yeah. We should say, what, like... What I if think... you can make a whole game off of that kind of thing? Isn't that kind of what dexterity <laughs> games are? Yeah, but I don't know of any dropping dexterity games. Maybe that should go on your list of games to design. I gotta add that to the list. I'm up to like ten game de- ideas now. <laughs> okay, so what? this game it's it's a lot of fun, and I think I always enjoy playing it. And there's a lot of reasons I should like it, but it always it just kind of slips down the list for me. And I think there's a lot of other games that I would rather play. So I would probably not put this as high if I were to do a hundred. I just I think there's that many other games that I would choose o- over it. I yeah. I can appreciate you know, like the simplicity and like streamlined of it, but I would rather play Blood in the Fog, or I would rather play Command and Colors, or I would rather play Rebellion, or probably Colonial Twilight. And some of that's just my taste of heavier games, but I don't know. I just it, it's some that just it it's just it's a game that's always kind of slips down the list for me. So I think like Harvest, this is a great game, but oh, yeah. where Harvest is a game that I feel fits into just about any collection. Memoir 44, it's kind of harder to see where it fits into a, a given collection. Like mm-hmm. you said, like we like the heavier war games. The setup cost to play Memoir means that we'll probably want to play some other game most of the time. Mm-hmm. It's something we've talked about in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah the setup can be annoying. And honestly, it, it, it's a little... it makes me wish that there was a block or chit version of the game because i don't love the minis that much and they're kind of a pain to just like grab and get separate them out and put them Mm -hmm. on the right hexagon but it's great i love it memoir 44 rolling down to number 49 is roll for the galaxy whoa another game that's not as good as star wars rebellion wow matt you really jumped on that one you don't like roll that much Oh, Rule is fine. It's a, I mean, it's, I wouldn't call it a super satisfying experience, but it, it's a great game. Is it because you think it ends too soon? It ends too soon, yeah. It's a quick game. Yeah, it's like 30 minutes. Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah, I, I like I, this I've game. Never it's played, fun. I've never sat down and played this game only once. I think we've always played Yeah, we it always played in times. groupings, yeah. played over and over again. And that's honestly, that's one of the reasons, reasons I like it. I did think it was a hair short when I first started, but like a few games I've played, once you know the game better, you, f- you realize that it's about the right length and there's a lot of tension in there. It's cool trying to find the different strategies and try to outguess your opponents on what actions they're selecting because it's a game in which each person locks in one of the five actions in secret and then you reveal in whatever everyone collectively chose are the actions that are going to play out that turn so there's a lot of guesswork involved in trying to predict what other people are going to do we've talked about the strategies quite a bit and i think there are I think there are like two obvious strategies you can go for and then like a few in between them that are more difficult. I don't know. It's it's fun to explore the game because it's so short that you can try something really crazy and wild. And if it fails spectacularly, it's only 30 minutes. You can try something else the next time. And I think that's kind of the key that makes it really good. It has the, the, the Yahtzee cup to roll your dice. That's a pretty great component. I think it might be one of the most satisfying dice rollers. Just makes that great noise. It and great noise, as, yeah. in speaking of components, this has some vividly colored dice, which I love. Absolutely. It's yeah. got a whole bag full of tiny, tiny dice. Sadly, you don't get to use as many as them as I had wished. I was hoping for like, you know, 20 dice at a time, but that's not really going to happen. You get up to like seven or eight 
usually at the most. Yeah, but it's it's still really satisfying to add dice to your collection and then use mm-hmm. them. And and sometimes there's like a flow of where they might uh, what, what they sit in certain areas, and so you might not rule them every turn. Yeah, well, sometimes you're kind of building up progress towards settling right. a world, so they'll just sit on the world for a couple turns. Or you might not have enough money to put them back into your cup, so they'll sit in your population area or whatever that's called. Or they'll sit on a planet as goods. So you're not rolling all your dice every time, um, but you do kind of cycle through them, and that is a big part of the strategy of cycling the right dice when you need them. I went through a period with this game where the first couple of times I played, I really enjoyed it. Then we were wondering about the balance of it, and we had some time trying to figure out and got better at the game. And I think as we, I've gotten better at the game, I've learned kind of to reappreciate that it is a pretty tight design with a lot of interesting strategic choices. I think, honestly, there are a lot of turn-by-turn decisions, but it's one of the more purely strategic games we have because you kind of want to commit to a plan and from the beginning, from when you get your your starting worlds or whatever, and kind of run with that strategy from there. Yeah, and that's something where I think... And maybe this is incorrect, but I think some of the starting worlds are demonstrably worse than others. And if you get kind of a bad draw, it just kind of sucks. I mean, the the mitigating factor there is that the game is, you know, 30 minutes. But and, and maybe I'm inexperienced and wrong on that, but that's been my impression. I think you. it's just better to give everyone a, a choice of two of each of the things instead of as the rules say just give everyone a random a random double world and a random single world yeah which is what we do right but that's a house rule honestly and i think you gotta play that way or else you know sometimes you're just gonna get hosed with two worlds that they they don't don't synchronize at all together together, which is which is frustrating the other thing i will say that has been a frustration is the upside versus down so like the variance of correctly predicting what someone else is going to do and incorrectly predicting can be really kind of painful of especially the ship produce cycle of you really want to do both of them each turn but you can't rely on someone else to do them so either you're being inefficient or you're you're just gambling and i think if you do it correctly you come out way ahead and if you do it incorrectly you just get nothing done that round yeah there's like the the military focused build as fast as possible strategy seems to be the, by far the most consistent and easy strategy to do but i think it's counterbalanced a bit by things like the ship produce strategy if it works out becomes a lot better which is an interesting dynamic it it deals a lot i think when you look at it from an angle of consistency and variability in the strategies and how much you want to try something a bit risky that's going to have a higher payoff. Yeah, and all that being said, I it's a fun game. I like it. I think it's a good game. I'd probably bump it down half a point from wherever you have it. Sure. Um, and down, you know, some number of spots. But it's not to say there's something, you know, inherently bad or wrong about the game. I just love kind of the addictiveness of it, of trying out different stuff. That's honestly the main selling point to me. That's fair. I just, I kind of, the novelty is worn off on me, so it's just kind of played again, but there's nothing, uh, it doesn't really like jump out and grab me. Yeah, that's fair. Moving on to another fun, short space game. This one much more silly. We have another Vlada game, Galaxy Trucker. Do you like this game? I, I forget. Oh, yeah. I, I love oh, it. Oh, yeah. You bought yeah. it, right? You bought the Oh, I thought you were being sarcastic, Ryan. No, I just, I <laughs> forgot because I. I think someone Matt hates, loves this game. Uh, someone hates this game, and I couldn't remember who it was. I, I thought we all liked this game. Maybe it was Emily that. Emily hates Emily this hates game. It. Okay. Yeah. This is a game where it's a it's a blast, and I love playing it. This is a game where your first play, you're just gonna get dumpstered on. Yes. <laughs> and it's just and it's just part of the experience. It's like it's like a like a hazing ritual. Yeah. You're just like <laughs> your ship is just gonna blow up and float off in all different directions. And it's just going to be terrible. (laughs) And if you can just enjoy the absurdity of it and laugh at your misfortune, it's great. And then you play it again and you you learn to like not leave exposed pipes and to have a good solid structure and not put, you know, radiation next to your population centers or whatever. 
and your ship does w- must so much better. Uh, but that is that is a consistent experience that I, I, we've I, seen. I, I feel like the way you're talking, I feel like you you really get the absurdity. I think you have to appreciate. You have to <laughs> yeah. just like oh you you it. have to you have to embrace the, embrace the absurdity I mean, of this game. Yeah, you have to expect that at least half of your ship will be pummeled into oblivion every round in this game, which is is really what just makes it so much fun. Yeah, an absolutely hilarious game of partially real time constructing a space truck out of spare parts racing against the clock there's this cool thing where like other people or you can accelerate the pace of the real time segment yeah by flipping over the uh, the sand timer and then almost this elaborate scoring system where you fly through space and encounter a bunch of different obstacles asteroids or pirates and things and they frequently blow up your spaceship i will say that it was pretty quick for us to get to the point with just the base game where we were all building very solid spaceships so it seems crazy hard the first time you play but around like the fourth or fifth time we played maybe even the third time yeah we were building really solid spaceships but then there are expansions and they just make the game really hard again but every part of this game is fun the real time at the beginning where you're building your ship from junkyard scraps in real time is just a blast and then um playing out the the mission cards as you're trucking across the galaxy it, it is awesome and and there's a lot of kind of different strategy that you can take there but it's all kind of lighthearted and ultimately it's absurd it's absurd yeah yeah and, but and it's it's it captures that kind of unique vlada nature of having something really silly and overwrought and and brutally punishing yeah and cute but horribly punishing at the yeah. same time it's kind of a lot of signature and this one might do it yeah. the most absurd but like really good strategy at the same time or at least it's a lot of signature of like this middle portion of his career because he started with you know a game like through the ages yeah which isn't cute or you know silly at all and then now he's gone to like party games, but in this middle there was the dungeon games and this and Space Alert and Bunny Bunny Moose Moose, and they all have this weird quality to it that I think is great. Vlad is it, amazing. It has maybe my favorite rule book. The rule book's hilarious. It's yeah. a classic Vlad a CGE rule book. Great game. That is Galaxy Trucker. Next on the list at number forty seven, something much more serious than Galaxy Trucker, and that is Fire in the Lake. This game is still probably the hardest game to play the first time that we own. It's this one or Here I Stand. Okay. That's, one of those two. Yeah. But this was a slog to get through the rules we also, that first this time. This was like the first like really, well, the first coin game and the first like really hard game we tried to learn and play. And it was, yeah, we jumped it was from, a challenge. We jumped from Twilight Struggle to this. And that's a pretty big rules overhead leap in the war game world i think the other thing that i think made it difficult is just all the the vietnamese names which were just i'm not familiar with and so i have no sense of i barely can figure out how to pronounce them and then i don't have no spatial idea of that's somewhere in the north or that's somewhere in the south or that was this city or something and so you're just always searching for it at least that was our experience yeah i don't know much about vietnam or the vietnam war but Ultimately, once you get it, or even game. when you oh, when you, when you partially get it, it's just a brilliant game. We talked about Colonial Twilight before. This is the next coin game on my list, and I think certainly the most complicated one about the Vietnam War. It has, I think, the greatest faction... Passive-aggressive it, relationship? Yeah, the greatest faction relationships I've ever seen in a game, and I think it's going to be hard to surpass the relationship between South Vietnam and the United States factions in Fire in the Lake of like all time asymmetric faction relationships because they hate each other so much but they're on the same team <laughs> it's it's really brilliant how well it's done where they're sharing resources they have somewhat similar but ultimately different 
goals and and how they get victory points. And then at some point, the U.S. just abandons them because the U.S. wants to send troops home. Usually right when South Vietnam needs them the most because the North is doing their big attack towards the middle end of the game. And it's a beautiful game relationship. It's just so well done. The game, I still don't understand in some situations how to actually accomplish what I want to do because the actions that you get as whatever faction, and those will be different, for, somewhat different for each faction, and what you're actually trying to do are often at like right angles. And so you have to kind of really figure out the implications of what you're doing and how that affects other players. And there's a couple of like cognitive steps you have to take to understand why something would be useful. And you have to have a knowledge of the game before you understand some of those things. But once you get through that rules overhead, it's really, truly a brilliant design. Yeah, it's a game I would love to go back to. I'm not sure when that'll happen, um, probably because of what I anticipate to be the next coin game on your list and another coin game that we haven't even played yet. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> that we, right. We have we one have, we haven't played we yet. We have unboxed it, but we haven't actually gotten it to table. But uh, yeah, no, it's... Uh, it's it's a great game. There's a lot there, and it's yeah. I would love to play it more. Yeah, absolutely. Swinging back into the world of pleasant games and also simpler games, we have the classic Carcassonne. Oh, the epitome of pleasant. At number forty six, I had always heard of Carcassonne. It was one of those games where it's like, yeah, you got to play Carcassonne. It's kind of a staple in modern board gaming. And then by the time I got around to thinking about buying it, I was like, eh, it looks kind of simple. Maybe it's just one of those beginners game. And, and then you got it, Matt. Yeah. And I played it with you and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's really good. <laughs> and then yeah. I bought my own copy. <laughs> yeah. This game is surprisingly good. It's just a game where you take a tile and you place it down on the table and that's your turn. And then you decide whether or not to play some meeple down to help yeah. score points or whatever. But it's really about the spatial puzzle of like constructing the game as you go and trying to fit the tiles in and place your meeples in such a way to maximize your points. A really, really simple scoring system that introduces, I think, a fair amount of strategy. And then Absolutely. again, it has like 500,000 expansions if you want to shake it up a bit. Yeah, and I, I've delved into some of the expansions. And I mean... You don't want to play with all of them at once, but it's super interesting what they add. I think Carcassonne has done expansions really well. I mean, kind Apparently, of... there's a catapult one that is like an inside joke among board gamers. <laughs> I've not played that one. I don't think they're doing it on the new reprints. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, one experience I remember is I, I've, I've played the app version of Carcassonne. Oh, I haven't gotten that specifically because I heard it's really addictive. Yeah, well, I mean, I remember playing this random person on the internet and they put down a farming. So so the farming meeples you put down will never come off the board. But you can score huge points if you if you have a large farming region at the end of the game. He put a farming piece down and I immediately completely closed his farming Oh man! Off, like in the next turn, and then he immediately disconnected after that. <laughs> it, it, I mean, you like, destroyed someone's day. I yeah, but <laughs> what that experience taught me was this game is brutally strategic. Yeah, just the way that you're managing your meeples uh, to maximize score, and it, you, you want the ability to have the huge farming payoff at the end of the game, but you also want to be scoring roads and cities as you go. It's it's just a blast to figure out how to best manage that, and at the same time, try to minimize what all of your opponents are scoring. Yeah, it, and exceedingly pleasant, and looks great. And in, in in all this, it's just the most pleasant countryside experience ever i th i think i would recommend this to the, the most casual gamer to you know we can we, we can still play it and have a blast yeah absolutely it, it works for everyone another game that fits in that category is the next one on my list number 45 forbidden desert which comes in a tin box which i love 
Is this the driest game we own? We've said that joke like three times already. It's good every time. Is it? It wasn't even that good the first time. (laughs) I didn't make it the first time. That's true, I think. (laughs) Anyway, this is a cooperative game from Matt Leacock of Pandemic fame. You won't find Pandemic on my list. I do think it's a good game, but not quite enough to make the list. However, Forbidden Desert, I think, is an improvement in pretty much every way. It's a game in which you have crashed your helicopter or something, and you're trying to find the parts for this magical flying ship thing, kind of a steampunk look to it, and escape the desert before it eats you or you die of thirst or... Yeah, that's basically the two options. Or the sand gets too too extravagant for you to navigate. Everyone has their own little role with a special ability, and you're just trying to uncover each of the tiles. And the coolest part of the game is that after everyone's turn, the storm shifts. So it starts with the eye of the storm in the middle of the game area where there's all these five by five grid of tiles, and then it just moves around. So you physically shift the tiles on the board. And so the whole play area shifts and twists and turns all throughout the game, which I think is just such a cool evocative mechanism to evoke a sandstorm. And it's challenging. It's difficult. It has cards that you can gather that will help you out in a pinch, which is always exciting. And I think it's easy to kind of dial in the difficulty level for your group to make sure that it's a thrilling finish at the end, win or lose. And I think a game that we say this a lot, that is fun if you win or if you lose. Like it's it's equally thrilling with a lot of interesting decisions and a really, really cool presentation. Yeah, it's a great game. One of the first like really fantastic co-op games we played. It still holds up after, you know, a couple of years and some other really fantastic co-ops. But yeah, it's uh, still solid. Yeah, another game you can introduce everyone to. Yeah. I know this is one that I played with my family, my parents, and uh, they they love it. But, uh, you know, the three of us play it and we love it. Yeah, absolutely. Also, the sequel's coming out soon. They announced, did I tell you about that, guys? Oh, yeah. Forbidden Skies. Okay, so yeah. we went the next Forbidden one. Island and then Forbidden Desert and now Forbidden Skies. Yep. That it, I'm, I'm, I'm super stoked. excited. Yeah, I think it's going to be another up in complexity, too, if I remember right from, from watching the announcement. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm, I can't wait. Number 44, a brilliant, brilliant game with honestly draw-dropping art, and that is Mysterium. Ooh. Ooh. Spooky. This is this is kind of a unique one. Yeah, it's it's this subgenre I realized was a subgenre earlier today when I was writing my review of Deception Murder in Hong Kong that I'm calling oh what did I call it? Hindered communication games. Okay. They're like cooperative games where one person on in the group or in the team is trying to communicate something to everyone else. But there's something just, there's some contrivance that makes it very difficult to communicate well. So, Codenames is one of those. Deception is one of those. Uh, Mysterium is also one where you're trying to communicate through dreams, which in the game are really, really awesome pieces of surrealist, abstract almost art. Yeah. The idea being that, again, you're communicating, you're a ghost communicating through dreams to try to lead people to find a murderer. It's got a bunch of unnecessarily fun components in there to kind of set the theme. It's honestly playing the ghost is one of the most fun board game and infuriatingly frustrating experiences you can have in a board game. And I love, I love both sides of it. I love the presentation. I love all the art. I love guessing. I love giving clues. It's just such a fun game that kind of ratchets up the tension every single round because you just desperately need people to guess the correct thing. Honestly, this is one of the games that I have just never had a bad experience with. It's it, it's just been fun every time. I think Mysterium's in contention for like the best artwork in any game I've played. I the, just love that style of art to begin with, and this, this is a really cool... yeah. yeah. The surrealist cards that you pass out are that the ghost passed out are are just absolutely fantastically done. 
We um, I just got the expansion. I don't think we've played with it. Did we play with it once? It was just more cards, right? It, it's mostly more cards. Mm-hmm. Nothing That's wrong good, with that. We we've played it enough times that I recognize most of the the dreams at this point, and so it'd be good to have some new scenes. Yeah. And looking back on the list now, like this game and the previous two is like a great starter pack intro yeah. to board games. Uh, Mysterium Forbidden Desert and Carcassonne. You can't go, you can't get much better than that for like simple, compelling, strategically interesting games that you can yeah. introduce modern board games to people with. I think Mysterium has the right level of difficulty too. Like I can, I can remember games that we've lost, and it's you know, it's also got a pretty easy way to to scale the difficulty. Also, yeah, we we play usually on the medium difficulty. Okay. Next, number 43 is a game that I played first at PAX a few years ago, and then I finally played with you guys at this previous PAX Unplugged, and that is Keyflower, a oh. really fun kind of crunchy Euro that incorporates, honestly, a really unique auction system almost. Yeah, like bidding auction system that has some weird quirks I've never seen before. What a dreadful game. What? I thought you enjoyed the game. Oh, this was the game at Pax and Plug that we played, and it was... This is the colored meeples and the hexes and the... Yeah. And you're building up, this like, game, the... This game, like, it went... F- wait a minute. This Wait a minute. This is the game where there's, like, the eight hexes in the middle, and you bid by putting the same colored meeples on, like, the face pointing towards you. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you liked it. It was fun, but it was also brutal. Oh, yeah, it's a mean game, and it's like, <laughs> yeah. there's a lot to think about, it's, but... It's a brain burner, for sure. For sure, but, like, I, I love it when when, I, when my brain hurts, yeah, and this no. one hurts my brain. It, it, it hurts good. I think it's just so unique. When you set up to play the game, you think it's going to do something, and then it just does something different. Like, everything's just slightly different than you think it's going to be, and I think in, in good and interesting ways. It just makes everything difficult. <laughs> That too. It's it's a difficult game. I mean, but the thing is, when you look at the pieces in the box, you're like, oh, these nice colored meeples and these little hexagons, and you kind of put together a town. This will be a nice, like, you know, midweight euro. And then you play it, and you're just like, oh, yeah, yeah. You're just battling over every inch yeah. of ground you can get. What really makes it incredible is the bidding on the you, tiles. Yeah, the auction system's so cool because yeah. you can just move your bid to somewhere else like once you know you've lost it. Yeah. But you have to keep all the meeples that you're bidding with for each individual tile the same color. So you may not have a place to move that those meeples to and there's just so many things you have to think about and work out. Yeah, and, but and it, like you can work tiles in other people's towns, but then your meeples stay there and they don't come back to you. Right. Oh right. yeah, you're, that whole thing. You're yeah. creating your town with the with the, the tiles, tiles that you, you win. win. Yeah. And you can use those actions, but you can also use other people's actions, but you don't get those meeples back. The ships that come in at the beginning of each season are another interesting bidding thing. Mm-hmm. But the whole thing is just a, a total brain burn. Yeah, absolutely. Which means, of course, the next one on the list is going to be the opposite of a brain burn. It is actually a very light game. Maybe the lightest one on my top 100. Number 42, Lost Cities. Lost Cities, the card game, not the board game. Yeah, I've heard the board game version is just unnecessarily more stuff. But yeah, I was the trying. I was at a board game cafe uh, maybe a few months ago, and we had you know a little bit of time. I think it, they were actually setting up the escape room for us, and I was like, "Oh, let's pull out Lost Cities and play this." And it was actually the board game, and so I started unpacking all this stuff, and I was like, "Boy, I don't remember all these all these pieces." And then I remembered, "Oh, yes, this is the board game version, not the uh, the more simple card game version." Yeah, so it's a game where you're trying to ostensibly go on these archaeological adventures. In practice, that means you're trying to place cards down in front of you in ascending order. But you're very much stymied by the fact that you can only have eight cards in your hand. You have to play one and then you draw one. So you can play one to the tableau in front of you and start an an exploration, even though maybe it's the three and you wish you had the one and the two first. 
or you can play one to like discard in the middle of the table but that means that your opponent can then pick that one up when they draw a card and just that little dynamic of trying to push your luck or trying to go a little bit farther just to make sure you have the right run in hand to get positive points on your expiration or maybe waiting for one of the handshake agreement cards that doubles or triples the points you gain from that exploration. It's a lot of luck based on what you draw, but it's that fun kind of tense push your luck thing combined with a really tight back and forth two player struggle to try to hold off giving your opponent cards that they need while still waiting for the cards that you want to be able to maximize your score. It fits kind of perfectly into that spot of game that I think is actually quite clever and interesting, but when I play it, I don't have to really think that much. It's just like, eh, I'll take a risk here, or eh, I'll play the safe play this time, and you just kind of play it out and I find that really enjoyable. I, I love Lost Cities. And then the final game on this list, rounding out my middle quintile on my top 100 games of all time, number 41, is Noosefjord from Uwe Rosenberg, which we got to play at PAX East. And I kind of fell in love with it. I think it was very clever. It's got all that Uwe Rosenberg like variation and lots of different options. And for once, it wasn't that mean. It was just kind of pleasant fishing for stuff and clearing forests and replanting forests. And most significantly, I think all those cool buildings that there are just like hundreds of in the game that promote different strategies and give you all kinds of different ways to generate points in the end. I, I thought know. it was delightful. I don't know about hundreds, maybe tens. There's three. Sets no, of we used decks. like a third of one of the decks in yeah. that whole game. There are like four 20, decks. Uh, maybe sixty. 30. Anyway, yeah, you're right. But no, we used a third of one of the four decks. No, there's A, B, and C, and there's three sets of A, B, and C. I think. I thought there were four. I only remember seeing three. I maybe think there's there easily four. over a hundred buildings. Not a, not in any one game you're playing, but in the box. I mean. Yeah. I'm surprised yeah, that you put this this high. I mean, I enjoyed it. I it was uh, I had a lot of fun playing it. It was one of the highlights for packs of packs for me. Um, but I I'm just surprised it's in your top forty one. Yeah, I I I I would play it right now. Like I want to play it more. I'd play Star Wars looked... Rebellion right now. Um, no, but you wouldn't. That's this, a lie. <laughs> this game is is really good. Honestly, the the thing that. I remember most about this game is the really cool. What was it? Town leader, the, the elders, elders. Like the, elders. Elders. the yeah. Viking elders, the, plate, the, the plating feast the, with like the plates. The, yeah, the high table. Sort that of. was a yeah. cool it was interactivity. Such a cool thing where like you can put fish on there to score points, but then other people can use those fish to activate their elders or get new elders. But then it's cheaper to fill it up. Like the more the more empty plates at the table, the cheaper it is to fill it up. So you're trying to time it such that you can uh, hit a sweet spot and fill up a, a bunch of cheap plates to get, you know, maximize your coin efficiency. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, so I, I think sure. the game has this really cool, um, you have the buildings, you have the elders, you're balancing trying to build ships in with that. Mm -hmm, yeah, to, to ship off your stuff. Yeah. There's a lot of your goodness in the game, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it was, you know, I, it has a lot of things you see in a lot of Euros. I like Euros. But to me, the the thing that kind of elevates it over a lot of games is that I saw so many different strategic paths available that all looked really compelling. And I love that sense of having kind of the openness to take the path that you want to take based on the, you know, the variability of those buildings. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, like, again, I, I looked to see if I could buy the game when I got back from PAX, and it's it's out of stock right now, sadly. Like, I really wanted to get a copy and just play it some more and explore it. I love the theme, too. I know, like... It's a cool theme. I, You're I, like I, Nordic fishermen. Yeah, I want to live in the world in Neustfjord, just walk in forests and eat fish all day with Nordic Vikings. Yeah, let's do it. That's a world I want to be transporting. Most of the time you think of, like, a board game universe... 
You're like, oh, if you could live inside any board game, you're like, I don't want to live there. It's horribly violent. Or, <laughs> man, it seems like I have a high likelihood of dying. Or that seems really dour. Newsport, you just get to chill with Vikings and eat fish? Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, I'm into that. Anyway, that is the last one on this installment of my top 100 games. What do you guys think? We're, we're three-fifths of the way through. Are you super surprised about anything? Is there anything that you expected by now? I'm not super surprised by anything. Any um, games that you think won't be higher, or anything, any games that you suspect won't be on higher on the list that you were surprised was left out? I remember um, thinking when I listened, uh, I, I listened to your um, hundred to eighty-one podcast. I kind of wish that Riftwalker was higher, although I can understand where it is. But uh, I mean, honestly, once we hit. There's a lot of games that I think are good and very good. And that's kind of the territory we've been going with through these first 60 games. Like, these are all games I'm like, yeah, these are great games. Or these are really good games. And it starts ramping up a lot more, I think, once we get to the top uh, 30 or so, I'd say. It starts really ramping up. Because, you know, it's kind of a bell curve overall, and we're hitting, we're going down one slope of the bell curve, essentially. So, yeah, the difference between game 45 and game 95 is not enormous. The difference between game 5 and game 45 is huge, I think. So, I think that'll be interesting seeing the next, seeing how you guys react to the next two lists. Anyway, that's the podcast for today. Don't forget to check out the thoughtfulgamer.com where we have lots of reviews and discussions and all kinds of good stuff on there. Hit me up on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, and don't forget to rate and review this podcast on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts. If you want to watch our further installments of the Top 100 Games Countdown, just pay attention to social media. We're live casting all of these for the world if you want to have access to all the podcasts through live streaming and chat with us and the other people who support the thoughtful gamer go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer and just pitch in just a little bit of money per month it helps us i guarantee you every dollar is appreciated to help keep us going both through the website and the podcast we will be back next week with a normal podcast of something i don't i don't plan that far ahead i'm a chronic procrastinator in two weeks we'll have the countdown from 40 through 21 we'll talk to you all again soon goodbye peace out bye